I'm Alan Jay. I'm the executive director of ZOA. Welcome to ZOA Book Club featuring David L. Bernstein, author of a fantastic book, Woke Antisemitism, How a Progressive Ideology Harms Jews. Before we get started, I'd like to thank my colleague, ZOA Director of Special Projects, for curating the ZOA Book Club and for allowing Dan and me to guest host tonight. I'd like to also thank ZOA Communications Manager, Jackie Schaefer, for once again sitting behind the controls and making sure another ZOA virtual program goes off without a hitch. We expect to have time for Q&A at the end of the program. We'll be using the Q&A feature, which you'll find at the bottom middle of your screen on most uh, applications. Uh, so please post your questions there. Before I hand the mic to Dan, I want to tell you now that you will not want to miss a program we have scheduled for next week. I, it's on Wednesday, February 15th at a slightly odd time, 12 noon, when ZOA Greater Philadelphia Executive Director Steve Feldman will be interviewing M.K. Simcha Rothman and renowned Professor Eugene Kontorovich, and they'll be discussing an extremely timely and critical issue about judicial reform in Israel and why it matters. A little bit later on in the webinar, we will post a link on the screen so that you can uh, register. Please register for that. It's an extremely important topic. Uh, with so much business already taken care of, I'd like to turn the program over to my friend and colleague, ZOA Director of Government Relations, Dan Pollack. Thank you, Alan, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we're very pleased to have my friend, uh, David, here today, David Bernstein, who has written this excellent book. It's right here. And I uh, really enjoyed reading it, but you didn't come here to hear my book review. You're here to hear an interview with the author. So I'll tell you about David very briefly. He has a lifetime of accomplishments, but right now he's the founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. That's his full-time job. He was previously the president and CEO of the JCPA, the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, the umbrella group over all the Jewish relations councils in the country. He was also previously executive director of the David Project, which some of you may be aware of. Uh, he is an executive at the uh, AJC, American Jewish Congress. Committee. Committee, sorry, thank you, David. I get confused. Uh, he has an interesting background, like me, he comes from Ohio. And he attended, uh, this is unusual, he attended uh, uh, yeshiva in Israel between high school and college, I believe, or maybe right around- College and graduate school. But yes, yeah, between college and graduate school. So getting these details wrong, sorry, David. No worries. But he actually has studied the Talmud, which is something that uh, not all our guests have done. I'd like to add a personal note to all of his qualifications. Uh, when David was in charge of JCPA, you know, we're involved in the Jewish communal life, but we're sometimes tolerated, ZOA. And he actually spoke up for ZOA's right to be heard and, and, and to be participants in the community forums that we have in the Washington, D.C. area. And I was per personally thankful for that to David, so I wanted to extend that. But we really want to talk about this book, and it really is quite an interesting book. The first question is, your title is Woke Anti-Semitism. What do you mean by woke? Yeah, that's the $64,000 question. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. I can see the list of people and see some good friends and acquaintances, so it's wonderful to be in conversation with you. So what do I mean by woke? I mean two things. First, that Bias and oppression are not just a matter of personal attitude, but they're embedded and ingrained in the very structures and systems of society. They're in the air we breathe, as they say. Um, they're in every nook and cranny of our political and social system. That's what uh, we mean by woke, where, where people are awoken to those, those systemic realities. The second basic idea of wokeism is that only those who are oppressed have the insight and the qualification to define the oppression for the rest of society. So 
If you're black, you get to define what racism is for society. If you're Muslim, you get to define what Islamophobia, if you're gay, homophobia, and so on and so forth. Jews may be not so much with anti-Semitism. <laughs> um, so, um, so that's what I mean. Now, I want to say, though, but, uh, to sort of provide a caveat here, that both of those things can be true. I mean, Jews have lived in systemically oppressive societies where there's been systemic anti-Semitism. So how can we deny the possibility of systemic oppression? Um, also, as Jews, uh, many of us have experienced anti-Semitism, and I think we have something to say about anti-Semitism that the rest of society should hear us out on. But that doesn't mean we have an unqualified monopoly, an unqualified ability to, to define how other people think about these issues. In a liberal society, and by that I mean a small L liberal society where people get to argue and debate each other and have differences of opinion, somebody gets to challenge you on that. That's just the rules of the game, right? That's the operating system of our liberal democratic society. And, and so that's what's lost in wokeism in a way. Wokeism wants to replace that idea of an open democratic society with one in which somebody, whoever those somebody are, the people with all the answers get to dictate to everybody else what they have to think about these issues. And, um, and I think that's fundamentally bad for society and fundamentally not good for the Jews. If I can paraphrase you in the book, it seems like your chief argument with wokeism is that we in the Jewish tradition and in the Talmudic discourse and every other facet of our lives, we're really good arguers as Jews. And it's a kind of a core element of coming up with the right answer in Jewish history and Jewish thought in everything Jewish. And you think, I think if I'm correctly understanding it, that the woke movement is asking Jewish liberals to put that aside in the interests of an orthodoxy that is beyond dispute. Is that a fair yes. summary of your thoughts? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, Jews, one key aspect I think of the Jewish tradition, the Jewish way of being is machloket l'shem shemaim, arguments for the sake of heaven. Um, the Talmud and the entire Jewish religious tradition is really built on layers of arguments between rabbis over the generations. And many of us have sort of uh, inculcated that in our children as well. I, I raised my kids at Shabbat dinner arguing over issues. And it didn't matter what their beliefs were. My job was to take the opposite point of view. And that helped them become critical thinkers. And that helped them think through their ideas um, in, a, in a more rigorous way than they might have otherwise. Um, and I feel like that that's been taken from us. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm so sort of personally affronted by woke ideology is I learned by arguing. I learned by, by, by thinking through out loud my opinions with other people who might have different opinions than me. And we go back and forth. And then, you know, I sharpen my own way of thinking because I might be wrong sometimes. And, um, and that, helps me, uh, that helps me clarify my thoughts. And so that, that debate culture, which I think most Jews recognize, not all Jews do it, but most Jews recognize in, in Jewish culture is being really taken from us. And I think we've got to push back against it. And I find it very hard to understand why certain progressive Jews and progressive rabbis even are, are so insistent that they have all the answers and want to shut down the debate on these really, really important social questions that are at stake. I want to continue with that discussion, but even more important that I really want to make sure we cover is your forward is by Natan Sharansky, one of my heroes of all time. Can you tell us how you got him to write the forward and, and what the similarity is between his experiences in the old Soviet Union and what we're heading towards with this wokeism? Yeah, so Natan Sharansky has made it very, very clear that he's opposed to wokeism. And I already knew that. Um, I had heard him talk about it. I'd been in a meeting where he spoke out against it. Um, so we were uh, we were very interested in um, and engaging him when we launched this organization, the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. He was a signatory of the original letter that the organization put out in public. And, um, and so I knew where he stood. Um, one of the first live stream events the organization had was with Jews from the former Soviet Union. And as you can imagine, almost any Jew from the former Soviet Union who grew up under totalitarianism does not, does not resonate to woke ideology. That might be the understatement of the year. In fact, they hear echoes 
of to the totalitarian ideology that they were fed in schools every time somebody makes a woke platitude. And Natan Sharansky is no exception. And he writes about this, he talks about this. And, um, and so I knew I had a shot at him and uh, reached out to him and uh, he was very busy, especially with the war with Ukraine. And even so, he still took the time to write the foreword for the book. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think he feels that strongly that this is an important issue for the American Jewish community and for America. Well, he, it really comes through. In fact, when you talk about your decisions to establish and go your own way from the rest of the Jewish community, I think Sharansky's narration of the way he saw things back in the Soviet Union was a big factor in it, if I'm not mistaken, from the way you describe it in the book. You didn't want to be one of these essentially hypocrites who was limited in what they that they what they were doing was not aligning with what they were thinking. Right. So Sharansky calls it double think. And he he noted that many people in the former Soviet Union would have very quiet conversations with their very closest friends or confidants or, or family, then say something completely different in public or at the workplace. Because and they were living lives of doublethink that were fundamentally, you know, totalitarian. And so when he sees people self-censoring at record rates in the United States, and that is true, by the way, we have we have surveys of this that Americans are self-censoring at absolute record rates at higher rates than they were during the McCarthy era. Um, so um, so he sees that in our body politics. He sees people walking on eggshells. He knows that that's not healthy. And, and many other Soviet Jews do too, or Jews from the former Soviet Union know that's not healthy. They don't want the country that they fled to to sound like the country they fled from. And so that they're, they're very opposed to this viscerally. And that's where Natan Sharansky really comes in and, and articulates an entire framework for it. Well, Yes, and in the American Jewish community in particular, surely you've come across, and I think you give examples in the book, where people in the organized Jewish community are practicing that same type of double think. Before you answer, though, I'd just like to remind everyone, we're going to do questions and answers through the Q&A function in Zoom, not through chat. So if you have questions you'd like us to ask the speaker, the author, Please put them in the Q&A. Go ahead, David. Yes, there, there are a lot of Jews who have deep misgivings about this ideology. Jews who might have been liberal their entire lives um, are feeling uh, the effects of illiberalism in the Jewish world, in their workplaces, and their social lives, and everywhere else. Um, and many don't like it. And that's why I get uh, all these Facebook messages. They come from email as well. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I wish I could join you in this effort, but you know I might lose friends or I might lose a job or whatever. And sometimes they might lose a job or lose friends. Um, but uh, there's a lot of double think, a lot of people who are sort of squirming in that hypocrisy and don't like it, don't like the feeling of it, but don't wanna risk anything that might help reverse their own plight and reverse the plight of society. So, my takeaway from the book was one of profound hope. I have seen the same things you saw, but I wasn't sure that there were people like you before you yourself started writing these articles and ultimately the book that were doing anything about it. So I am profoundly hopeful about it. But at the same time, I noticed in your book, you have a lot of autobiographical details and you have in my view, maybe a unique biographical set of details that is somehow different from the other people I have known in Jewish communal life. And I wanted to ask you the question, maybe a provocative question, but in, in, a, good, in a good sense, could you possibly be an outlier? Is there reason to see that because you have gone on this intellectual journey and arrived where you have, is there really reason to believe a lot of other people are going to be following in your footsteps? It's a, yeah, it's, it's a good question and a deep question. Um, I, I, I think the answer is that there are a lot of people out there who agree with me, and there's a much smaller percentage of people out there who are willing to speak up about it. And I don't know if that's a result of my unique upbringing or just my sort of unique psychology. You know, there, there's a certain type of person 
uh, a gadfly, the, the kind of person that just cannot be, you know, put in an ideological cage and told what to think. I'm the kind of guy who would have gotten killed in the Soviet Union, you know, I mean, that's just not that, you know, so here I'm not going to get killed. No one's going to disappear me, as Sharansky says. So that's good. Um, I just I just have to find another job and, and find a way of monetizing my uh, my opposition to this ideological insanity. Um, you know, look, I was raised in a very interesting way. My mom is from Baghdad, Iraq, a Jew, Jew from Baghdad. And um, and so I grew up with a grandmother who lived in our house with relatives who, who lived in our house speaking Arabic. But they also brought with them that that immigrant narrative of, of that the streets are paved with gold. And so I, I had um, an acute sense of what it meant to be an American because I grew up in an immigrant household and many other immigrants have that same that same sensibility growing up with parents who knew the difference between the tyrannical regime they grew up with and the free country that they went to as imperfect as it might be so that that was one key experience I also grew up you know with a, with a civil libertarian father who who thought that the ACLU had it right when they allowed the Nazis to march in in Skokie, and I, I embraced that ethos as well. I thought, well, you know, I, I certainly don't like the Nazis, but if this country values free speech, doesn't have to let everybody have that freedom of speech. So that was my attitude. Unfortunately, the ACLU of today is nothing like the ACLU of, you know, of those days, of the 1970s. It's a totally different organization that's sort of gotten the woke virus and, and never looked back. Um, so, um, so that's an aspect of it. Another aspect is I grew up experiencing a good deal of anti-Semitism in the public schools of Columbus, Ohio. And, um, and I think that that made me acutely aware of the dangers of anti-Semitism and maybe sensitive to what other Jews might be experiencing. And, and so any sign that an ideology or, or a dogma might give rise to more anti-Semitism is something that, um, that, you know, I would viscerally oppose. So, you know, those various factors in my life sort of conspired to make me to oppose this ideology. Um, you know, I grew up um, sort of a liberal in two senses of the word. Um, I grew up, you know, basically supporting, you know, the, the, uh, the canon of liberal causes, church-state separation, immigrant rights, maybe criminal justice reform later, um, you know, abortion rights and the like. And the like. Um, but I also grew up a classical liberal. I really believed in free expression of ideas and free speech and civil liberties and the like. And, and what happened is that those two basic sets of ideas became disjoined. And, and so um, I no longer felt comfortable in sort of the broad liberal camp, which became increasingly hostile to the idea of free speech. Um, and so I think there are a lot of people out there like me and there, are, and some have that psychology, like you know, Barry Weiss didn't grow up exactly like me, but she has that same psychology. She just can't stand not being able to express her authentic point of view. And I think there's a lot of others out there like me, and um, I aim to help create an environment where they can come out of the woodwork and and speak up for themselves. Because just like cowardice is contagious, so is courage. And we've got to create sort of a spiral of courage that lets more and more people who feel the way that they do come out and stand up for their own authentic point of view. I, I was fascinated in your in your book with the way that you make an analogy with the LGBT movement and the gay rights movement, where there were many gay people that were closeted and they all thought that they were the only ones that were experiencing this. But once they started coming out, they saw that there were many other people in the same situation and, and many fellow travelers who uh, wanted to, to support them. And you make an analogy with where we are now in the fight against wokeism. Could you make that analogy? And I'm really interested to see, you know, if you think that is what's occurring since your book has been written and if you're starting to see that happen. Yeah, I do believe that the coming out phenomena is exactly the way to change. And I think it is having an effect like i think the the ideological environment is looser now and more auspicious for free speech than it was a year and a half ago you know in the immediate aftermath let's say of george floyd and all the dei insanity that came out right after george floyd um you know i i was very, i was early on kind of reluctant to use 
the closet metaphor because you know it's 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 owned I think in some ways by the gay rights movement. But Jonathan Rauch, who's Jewish and um, one of the one of the great minds behind sort of the freedom of expression liberalism movement, wrote an amazing book called The Constitution of Knowledge. He also was a, an architect of the gay rights movement and wrote a book, a very well-respected book on same-sex marriage. And he's the one who said to me that that metaphor is exactly the right roadmap for the free speech movement as well. So I feel more comfortable and confident in using that. And I do believe that that's what's happening. Um, you know, a little story, if you wouldn't mind. Um, a, um, a, a, about two months ago, I... Um, I spoke before a Shabbat dinner service in the Washington, D.C. area. And, you know, I'm always a little reluctant, a little nervous before I speak because I'm worried that somebody's going to come and heckle me or whatever. It's happened. Um, and, um, and yet nothing happened at all. In fact, the rabbi did an amazing job interviewing me. It went off without a hitch. And I, you know, drove home sort of on cloud nine. Uh, it was one of the early speeches that I gave about the book. And then, um, and then a couple of days later, the same rabbi calls me up and says, apparently, David, you have detractors, um, you know, no duh. And, uh, and what, what, what he told me was that another rabbi in a, uh, in a rabbi's meeting, um, when he mentioned my book and mentioned me and mentioned the idea of woke anti-Semitism, shut him down and said, that's part of the problem, not part of the solution. And another rabbi agreed, and they couldn't have the conversation about my book. Which kind and, of proves, I'm sorry to interrupt, doesn't that prove your thesis? <laughs> exactly, exactly <laughs> proves my thesis, exactly. Um, and, and so, you know, so what I, you thought, what, the moral of the story there, Dan, is that, is that the vast majority of American Jews are perfectly willing to hear this message. They're perfectly willing to debate the issues. They're perfectly, uh, they, they're not ideologues. Even if they're center left, they're not ideologues. It's only the gatekeepers in our community, and there are not a lot, but there's enough to make it very hard to, to hear a multiplicity of views who are stifling discourse for the rest of society. And that's for all kinds of reasons that we can, we can go into. But what I've also learned in this process is you can, you can very often get around the gatekeepers. And you get around the gatekeepers by finding the sponsors, by finding people who agree with you and are willing to use a little bit of their social capital to get you into the room, to get you to speak at the synagogue, to get you to speak to their federation or to their JCRC or to their, you know, American Jewish Committee office or wherever else. And, and they get around the gatekeepers and then you can have the discussion. And I think if we do that enough, if we, if we, not, we don't have to knock them down the door necessarily every time. Now we can just ring the doorbell because it's gotten easier. We ring enough doorbells. So I think we're going to change the culture over time. Well, I just have one more and then I'll, I'll give it to uh, Alan and then we'll open it up to the questions that people have been sending in. And my last one is, um, you're, as you said, a man of the left. And we, at least most of the people on this call, speaking for myself, we want to be liberals in the second way you talked about, but we really don't want to be in the first way. But what is really the problem? When you were in the Jewish communal world, you were working on a strategy, which you make explicit in the book, to minimize the difficulties with allied groups and not focus on our disagreements in search of a common cause. Why can't you continue? Why couldn't you continue down that road to make common cause when there were issues that you agreed, for example, anti-Black prejudice uh, in this country, that you're very much on the side of many of the people that were castigating you. But why, why not, what's the danger in minimizing our differences in order to accomplish common goals? Yeah, so in 2009, an organization that some of you may have heard of called the Reut Institute, it's an Israeli think tank, wrote a white paper on the delegitimization of Israel. They named that phenomenon delegitimization and BDS flowed from the effort to delegitimize Israel. And they suggested that mainstream Jewish organizations engage the left in conversations and discussions and try to peel off what they would call the fence sitters on the left 
who were my, who weren't necessarily pro-Israel, but not necessarily anti-Israel either. And if you could convince them that this was not the way to advance peace, that there were better ways of advancing peace, then they wouldn't go down the path of delegitimization. And I think that that paper, and I think that sort of the history of Jewish community relations was such that, you know, Jewish groups tried to spend a lot of time on the left, building up these ties, building up these alliances to stop the left from going down that more radical path that we'd all seen before. Um, and, and maybe it worked a little bit, not always, sometimes, but as the environment started to shift, as woke ideology started to become more mainstream within left-wing circles, um, as Black Lives Matter um, became a dominant voice and changed the narrative to a sort of a press or press binary in many circles, it became harder and harder for mainstream Jewish voices to join forces with the left without sacrificing core principles. So let me give you an example of this. I was very involved in criminal justice reform, right? And the idea was, it was a place where many uh, Black Americans felt very strongly about, and it was a way, if we could engage that issue and do something good for society, we could also engage Black Americans in the discussion around who we are as Jews and Israel and the like. Um, what happened over time, though, is that because of woke ideology, many people started to uh, erect litmus tests so that you couldn't really become part of the coalition unless you first signed up for the ideology, unless you first said that America is a white supremacist, oppressive country, that became the new the new norm in these circles. And um, and so Jew, some Jews like me said, "Wait a second, I'm not willing to say that. That's not how, what I believe." So if, if need be, I won't be in the coalition. I can't be in the coalition because I'm not going to. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to if engage I'm, in that kind of advocacy. If I'm not mistaken, they would actually explicitly at meetings say to the Jewish participants, "In order to have a voice here, you must say these things now." Right. Yeah. Now I called the question. I, I said to them, "Can I be part of this coalition if I if I agree with you that we need to change, make some changes in the criminal justice?" Um, system, but I don't agree that America is a white supremacist society. And the answer almost unanimously, I think it was unanimously in this coalition meeting was no, uh, you can't. That's and just so crazy. I, and that's a very right. un-Jewish response, right? It's an un-Jewish response. Now, there was another, there's another aspect of this dilemma that, um, that we saw in California. I'm sure many of you are aware of the ethnic studies curriculum in California um, that came out. Now, the first version of ethnic studies that came out that uh, before the California legislature was um, was very anti-Semitic, very radical, very anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, you name it. Um, and obviously, the, that that a lot of Jews, mainstream Jews, jumped into action to try to change that. Uh, but it split the Jewish community into two camps. One camp in the Jewish community was willing to work with the state in, in sort of molding the agenda and getting out of the getting rid of the anti-Israel and anti-Semitic stuff. But it then had to agree if it was going to have any influence to this idea, this fundamental underlying framework that um, that America is an oppressive country. So the price of admission into having an influence on Jewish issues in the ethnic studies curriculum was buying into the overall framework. There was another set of Jewish groups um, that opposed that. And, um, and they said, no, we're not going to buy into this idea that America is an oppressive society, even if that means not having any influence over the way you treat Jews in Israel. Because we know that if that curriculum is, becomes the, the, the dominant curriculum in California schools and, and then is exported as things are from California to other states around the United States, that we're going to be dealing with a game of whack-a-mole on anti-Semitism. Because once that oppress oppressor binary seeps into all of our discourse, into our education system and the like, you're going to see anti-Semitism because Jews will always, always be conflated with the oppressors. You can't define Jews in this framework as being an oppressed group. They won't buy into it because they view success and oppression as the same thing. I think that we're seeing that very much uh, play out now. And people who don't know, ZOA has been very involved in the fight against that California curriculum, even in its revised form, which is, I guess, slightly less objectionable, but still has big problems. Alan Jay, you wanted to take a couple of questions? I, I Well, yes. Actually, David, I don't have as much a question as I would like to share some of these observations and ask you for your comments. 
Um, I found your book to be a real page turner, honestly. You bring into focus that liberal doesn't only exist in the political arena and that we Jews can have differing opinions about many issues. We can debate candidates or parties or administrations. But what we, what we Jews must never debate is the merits of the Jewish state of Israel and the inalienable rights of Jews to enjoy the same protection as every other class in the world. We must never tolerate anti-Semitism. In this age of hyperpolarization, there seems to be no mid-ground. But, you know, ZOA, when Mort Klein was honored for his 25 years of service at our last, well, uh, 2019 gala, he chose a liberal guy. He chose actually Alan Dershowitz to be the presenter of his, of his um, award. And the point that I'm making is that they demonstrated such great respect to one another, even given differences, um, and, and told each other about the merits and how they learned from one another. You point out in the book uh, that the Jewish tradition and liberal ideology is to respect and to debate. Since joining ZOA, I've advocated that Jewish advocacy groups should learn to play nice in the sandbox when we have common cause. I recently heard you say in an interview if you're not at the table, you're lunch. I think this is brilliant and true. I expect there are those on the left of center space who question your decision to write the book, and it certainly would have been easier not to rock the boat. But you recognize that anti-Semitism is baked into critical social justice. You could talk, please, if you don't mind about, you know, the, 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 that you use the word woke in the title of the book, but that it's baked into critical justice system. And as you so deftly report in the book, you couldn't help but be true to your liberal training and to your core Jewish values. I personally thank you for having the courage to write the book for all the things that Dan has asked you and you've, and you've explained. I tore through the book and very much convinced that we can continue to debate divergent viewpoints, even while we remain committed to mutually fighting evils of anti-Semitism. The door is open for your comments. And if there's a question here, David, perhaps it can be how can JILV and ZOA convince other Jewish groups to unite and to recognize and join this noble fight? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's, there's more than one fight here. Of course, there's the fight for openness and discussion within the Jewish community. And I think we can try to model that, by the way. We can invite people who have divergent points of view into um, into discussion with us, you know, and, um, you know, go into a synagogue with, with a Jewish liberal who has a slightly different perspective on whatever it is and have a constructive conversation um, with them. I, um, I remember um, J.G. Goldberg and, uh, and Jonathan Tobin used to go travel the country and model what civic discourse could be like between the, sort of a, a, a center left and a center right person. I think we've got to do more and more of that kind of discourse. And maybe Jews in a way have a role to play in a very polarized, tribalized America. Maybe we can really truly live up to our, our billing as being a light unto the nation by showing what it can be when we, what it's like to disagree with each other in, in agreeable ways. Um, I think we're not there yet, but we, we've got to start somewhere. So let's, let's start modeling that ASAP. The, the other fight that I would say, and this is a different kind of fight, it's more of an, you know, it's, it, it's to convince mainstream Jews that we have a problem. We have a problem with woke ideology, and that woke ideology is giving rise to a variant of anti-Semitism. Many of them, I think, are, are in denial of that, and I think we've got to press the case for it as much as possible in an open way, discuss it. Maybe we're wrong. You know, of course, in the spirit of open discussion, we can be wrong too, but let, I think we've got, to, we've got to bring that discussion to the Jewish community. Um, you know, um, Jonathan Greenblatt of the ADL likes to compare anti-Semitism on the right to a hurricane and anti-Semitism on the left to climate change. Now, I have to say, I don't think that's a bad metaphor, actually, <laughs> but, 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 because climate change suggests it's more slow moving, it's more corrosive, but then I want to know what are the ideological CO2 emissions that are producing the climate change on the left? In other words, it's we when we talk about anti-Semitism on the right, we 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 talk about the ideological underpinnings. We talk about replacement theory and how this this notion that that immigrants are coming in and replacing ordinary Americans. And guess who's doing the replacing? Jews are doing the replacing. 
from behind the scenes and how that gives rise to anti-Semitism. And we, we don't shy away, most of us at least, from talking about the ideological underpinnings of, of Muslim anti-Semitism, of Islamism, this ideology of the infidel and the like that took hold in parts of the Muslim world. We, we know that that's one of the reasons why anti-Semitism uh, grew in the Muslim world. But yet, when we talk about anti-Semitism on the left, we talk about a symptom without causes. And I think one thing that we can do is help people connect the dots. So I'm willing to work with anybody to help help people connect the dots, have conversations that say, hmm, maybe it's no accident that anti-Semitism on the left is up. Maybe what happened at Berkeley Law School was no accident. Maybe that mapping project in Boston that, you know, provided the home addresses of a bunch of Jewish leaders by a really leftist group was no accident. Maybe there's a permission structure in place that what we call woke ideology that's that's fueling all this, that's that's helping people think in binary terms that makes them think of Jews as the oppressor or Israel as the oppressor. So I think we have work to do in convincing our own community there. And the best way to do that is at a thoughtful in a thoughtful, moderate way. Bring it to them, but bring it to them in a way that, that raises the question and allows them to think it through. Uh, Steve Feldman, one of our original directors, asks about intersectionality. You did such a great job defining wokeism. Let's talk about intersectionality, which is a related concept. And the question he asks in particular is, why is attacking Israel, why are not Jews why are Jews excluded from the intersectionality phenomena? And why is attacking Israel the central target of intersectionality? Yeah, so first of all, uh, let, let's, do, let's go back in a second to understand what intersectionality was originally. It was a term coined by a critical race theorist named Kimberly Crenshaw, who was actually talking about something very specific that, that you know, in our under the law, there are various protected groups, protected categories, uh, like, you know, your religion, your race, and so forth. And they found that there was a loophole in the law that Black women were not considered a unique protected uh, class under the law, and therefore were not... Um, we're not being treated as a protected class in that way. And, um, and so that's what she meant by intersectionality. Over time, intersectionality started to mean that, you know, one might have multiple identities like black, Jewish, disabled, and that those, I, those identities that were generally attached to being oppressed made someone even more oppressed than they would be otherwise. So that's what it meant. And like a lot of these concepts that we're talking about, a lot of these world concepts, there's they may explain some things sometimes. It's like not altogether wrong always. It's just that it's not altogether right always either. And they're pre pretending it's altogether right always. And so intersectionality is one such concept. The way it's played out, though, is not just about like how your own identity is as a person, but rather people started to connect their causes. So I remember in 2016, I saw a group at Columbia University called No Red Tape, and they were they were an anti-sex violence, anti-rape group in Columbia, mostly women activists, and they joined forces with the BDS cause under the guise of intersectionality. And I wrote about that in 2016 on my first day of the job at the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, and uh, it caused a bit of a firestorm. So. I, I was warning about this, you know, for, for quite a while, that this is actually a dangerous concept, not what intersectionality originally meant. Now, why aren't Jews part of that framework? Why aren't we considered a press group? We're, cons we're not considered a press group for a couple of reasons. One is that the, the definition of oppression is not what you think. It's not because Jews experienced the Holocaust and pogroms and have experienced discrimination. In this formulation, Racism equals prejudice plus power. I heard that first 20 years ago. Racism equals prejudice plus power. So if you're a group that's deemed powerful, like Jews are, because we're successful on average, then you can't be oppressed by definition. You can't, and you, you are powerful. So therefore, you really can't be a, a, a victim of oppression. You can't be a victim of racism. And by the same token, if you're a group that's deemed powerless, then you can't actually be a victimizer. So you can't really be a racist. Um, that's the way that this idea works. So in that ideological framework, Jews can't win. We, we can't define ourselves as being oppressed because they're not gonna see us that way. The other aspect of this is what, what you call whiteness. Um, Jews are being called white. Now, some Jews define themselves as white, some Jews like me, not so much. 
my mom's from Baghdad, Iraq, as I said. So I'm actually, according to 23andMe, 50.4% uh, Asian. So that means that I can credibly claim I'm not white, even by American standards. But, but in any event, this idea of being whiteness, whiteness is demonized. White, if you're part of the white class, you're, you're, you're part, by definition, of the oppressive class. And, and Jews are being deemed white, even if we not all of us, of us see ourselves as being white. Um, as my um, colleague Pamela Pereski, Dr. Pamela Pereski likes to say, when whiteness was considered a moral good, Jews weren't white. But when whiteness is considered an unmitigated moral evil, Jews are deemed white. And, um, and so I think that's the bind we're in. And I, and I don't think that we can successfully sort of define ourselves as a protected class within the intersectional matrix. I think that that's a lost cause. And I think instead we should just reject the entire formula. Well, is there, to follow up on that, I think that rejecting that entire formula is a tall order. Is it worth the fight to even challenge people in the paradigm? When I, when I am uh, in an unrelated fight, for example, about gun control or something on Twitter, and someone posts something about someone who expressed their opinion, and they'll throw the fact that the person is white into the argument in a completely unrelated way, I often say, what does being white have to do with this? And the answer is, they really think it does. Is that a fight oh, sure. worth even pursuing? That I think or you have to have that fight. I hate to say it. I know it's a tall order. And uh, Dan, you're absolutely right. It is, a, it is a tall order. But as long as this ideology obtains, as long as it's dominant, it's going to do two things. One, it's going to it's going to produce more and more anti-Semitism. It's going to maybe three things I'll say. It's going to make American society more and more liberal because if we can't talk about things, um, we can't debate things, we're going to become even more polarized. It also brings out really negative forces on the far right as well. So when you have an ideology on the left that that calls all white people privileged. Imagine you're the white dude who lives in, you know, a former manufacturing town. Not only don't you have a job, but your dad lost his job 30 years ago. And there's fentanyl addiction and all kinds of problems. Yes. And, and we so both know people in Ohio like this, I think. Yeah, I was going to Steubenville, uh, Ohio is the, the, the city that I always name. And you say to yourself, well, you know, you're telling me I'm privileged, you know, brings out a sort of a white identitarian politics that I think is also quite scary. And, um, and so I think that we end up in this vicious cycle of, of polarization, of identity politics that's bad for everybody, but particularly bad for Jews because we're always the canary in the coal mine. So it's a tall order, but I think we've got to start building that new order. Um, we've got to start, we start, we have to start building a new center in American politics. And by center, I don't mean equidistant from the right to the left. I mean, I mean, the ability of people to talk to each other, have conversations and converse and participate in democratic life. Um, that means people from the center left who, who reject this ideology and reject extreme ideologies on the right and people on the center right who reject extreme ideologies on the right and reject them on the left, they have a lot in common now. Let's let's get together. Let's start working together and and trying to recoup our democratic principles in this society and our common common polity. I think we've lost a lot of that in the last few years. So to me, that's the American project, but it's also the Jewish project. And even though it's a tall order, it has to be the new order, or we're going to be in for the long haul in this. Yeah. Uh, one question. I think I know the answer to from reading your book, but maybe you can give a couple of examples. It said you are in a powerful national position. To what extent did you try to change things when you were an insider? So I know firsthand some of what you've done, and I know some examples in the book, but I guess you're also a bit self-critical that maybe you weren't able to achieve enough when you did that. Yeah, look, it was very, very hard. I tried, but I also was acutely aware that if I went any further than I did, I would lose the job. And I had to decide for myself, did I want to go that far? Um, one of the really um, traumatizing incidents for me was when two Jewish demographers, Ira Sheskin and Arnold Dushevsky, wrote an article in E-Jewish Philanthropy saying that there were fewer Jews of color than this study that the Jew Jews of Color Initiative put out. Um, they said that there were 12 to 15% Jews of color. By that, they mean Black, Latino, and Asian Jews. And Sheskin and Dushevsky said, no, that's not what the Pew survey said from the past. It's probably more like 6 to 8%. And there was 
absolute firestorm of a protest against them. They were called racists. Um, there, there was a petition signed by 2,500 many prominent Jews uh, uh, calling them basically a racist. The head of the reform movement, um, somebody who I had respected over the years, um, accused them of, of white intellectualism, which is a, a term I had never heard before. <laughs> um, from coming from a, from a Jewish mouth of somebody who's an intellectual, no less. And, and, and I was asked to sign that, and there's no way in hell I would have sooner, uh, I would sooner quit than sign something like that. But um, I called up Ira, who I'd known for many years, and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not really able to defend you because some of the or member organizations were uh, part of this, you know, petition drive against you. Um, but I, I, you know, I really, uh, you know, I'm really sorry, you know, and I hated that. Like I hated myself for not being able to stand up for them. And, um, and so, you know, sometimes we face choice points in life and eventually I faced my choice point and wasn't able to, you know, go along anymore and had to start taking increasingly more daring risks so I could live with myself and not be squirming and double think forever. Well, we appreciate that you did that. Uh, ZOA has a, a little piece of that fight because when we spoke up against Black Lives Matter, our, our national president, Mort Klein, was uh, decried as a racist. We're not against Black Lives Matter, the slogan. We were against the particular movement, which you're very familiar with some of the anti-Semitic and anti-Israel elements that were in it. And uh, unfortunately, his greatest antagonists on speaking out on this were, were fellow Jews. And so we really, one of the questions we have is, how do we educate or turn around those Jews who are in denial or who have internalized the woke ideology? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm going to um, in true Jewish style take issue with the question, and that is to say that's not my first target audience. My first target audience is first to get the Jews who already agree with us to actually show a little courage. That's the first order. Then the second target audience are Jews who are deeply uncomfortable with the ideology, who don't like being told what to think, who feel that it's gotten a little bullying in its approach to get them to sort of over the edge and into our, our camp to speak out. Um, only later, later, far downstream, would I look at um, would I look at people who already have sort of bought into the ideology. I think that that they're very, very, uh, they're very, very comfortable where they're at and are not likely to change anytime soon. The, the Jewish, you are probably a counterexample of the way that Jewish assimilation is going. That's one of the reasons I asked you the question about the the outlier, in general, we're becoming, people are becoming less distinct, Jewish people in America. But you feel there's a, I think from the book, that there's a Jewish feeling that is fundamentally, you know, going to see that this is a fight worth fighting. But as we become more assimilated, is that something that's going to become more so? Or are Jewish people going to seek to keep a low profile and not be so salient in their differentness. What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of progressive Jews would, 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 would fire back and say, well, it's precisely because we're Jews that we're so aligned with this critical social justice movement. But I would say that Jews have always been the gadfly. We don't like, uh, we don't like political ideologies that force everybody to conform. That's never been our way. That's never been good for us. And so the people on the far left who are advocating for this ideology, I think that they don't realize that they're actually part of a dominant discourse and not, uh, not outsiders. They're actually using power in a very aggressive way that shuts down other people. And, um, and it's so ironic I, if I can interrupt because of what you right. said about the definition of power and bullying. <laughs> Right. Actually, in, in the real world, they seem to have the power. And right. yet still power, power doesn't, it's not only attached to whiteness or white privilege or whatever. Power can be attached to somebody's willingness to shut you down and find 10 other people who are willing to do the same. Um, you know, so power is a much more um, complex phenomena than what they've made it out to be. And it is an irony. It is an irony that, that, uh, that people who pretend to be 
progressive in some ways are actually, in some cases, in the more extreme cases, not all of them, there are people who really do mean well and they think they're doing the right thing and they're they're very nice and whatever, so I don't want to take issue with them. But there are other people who use this as a sort of a permission slip to be very mean and and, and bully other people into submission. And um, and this makes it easier for them to do that. And and that that is not uh, that is not Jewishness in my view. It is it runs counter to Jewishness. D David, can I ask one? Yeah, David, can I ask one more question? But first, I want to agree with you on another point. I like your philosophy of first going after the low hanging fruit. When we're looking for people to work with us, we might as well target the people that we have a good a good chance of recruiting. So uh, I agree with that. I don't remember if you answered this in the book, and I hope it doesn't exactly put you on the spot, but is there an answer to the question why anti-Semitism has worked itself into the woke ideology? I think there is. Um, I think that there is. Um, first of all, anti-Semitism, you know, is in the ether, right? It's the idea of the the powerful Jew working behind the scenes. So that that's sort of always deep in the consciousness of people because it's been around for so many thousands of years. So if you're looking for somebody to scapegoat when it comes to power, Jews are always there because it's already deeply embedded in their collective imagination. Um, but but then but then you know we're sort of the perfect minority group to go after, but we're not the only ones, Asian Americans as well. So you know or Nigerians even groups that are succeeding on average. Uh, you know, I think Asians, by the way, are really feeling this in, in a lot of ways. Um, and um, and so I would say that that when you have an ideology that holds that success is a sign of a that you're you're pressing others, then you're then Jews are going to always be lumped in with the oppressor group. And therefore, it's going to become a source of anti-Semitism. Well, we had a number of questions we didn't get to. I just wanted to thank you. Is there anything else you wanted to answer? that we haven't asked appropriately, David? Uh, yeah, what, one thing I would say is that I think we have a lot of options in front of us, ways that we can start to turn this around. One is, uh, you know, I've said it before, let's start to get more courageous. Let's create a spiral of courage. Um, and sometimes that requires us to find out the people who agree with us. And, and that can be a little awkward. I call it the awkward dance. So sometimes you can be in shul or wherever um, and, and sort of ask people what they think of that and, and find your friends along the way so that you can you can change the dynamic. Um, there are people who are who have, you know, who are deeply uh, philanthropic to certain institutions and they can, as one person said, um, you know, close their wallet and open their mouths. So that can be a source of leverage in this. You can be a sponsor. You can bring people like me and others who disagree with this ideology and to speak to your Jewish institutions and so forth and start to, you know, shake loose the monopoly that that these uh, gatekeepers have over over the community. And we can build a new coalition. And, and usually when I talk to Jews that are sort of on the Zionist center right, they tend to think evangelicals immediately. And I'm not, I'm not, in no way am I gainsaying evangelical engagement. I've done it for years and I think it's an important aspect of our of our collective work. But I, but I think that there are a lot of new immigrant groups, some not so new immigrant groups who are feeling the same thing that many Jews are feeling. Uh, there are many Asian American groups that are deeply worried about their kids. They want to live in a meritocracy. They came to this country to get away from all that um, ideology, and now they're feeling it in America as well. Um, the, the, the people who, who did that San Francisco recall um, and got rid of like three San Francisco school board members who wanted to change the name of high schools from Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln or what have you, those are our new friends. They were, they by the way, they won by a margin of 70% to 30% in San Francisco. Races. In San Francisco, what yes, does that tell you? It says that we can win this, but um, it's not gonna. We're not gonna win everywhere. This this ideology is very hard to dislodge from institutions that have very explicitly declared themselves dedicated to it. Um, you know, and, and they've almost they've almost given away their independent thinking to other people to think for them. And once that happens, it's called identitarian deference. Once that happens, it's very hard to recoup your independent thinking and to, and to move in a different direction. But many other, especially Jewish groups, by the way, they're sort of, they've sort of allowed this ideology, I would hope, to temporarily eclipse their core 
openness and liberal values. They're not perfect. No one's perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But they're generally willing to discuss and debate issues. That's been eclipsed by this ideology. And I think what we have to do is accentuate the contradiction between their internal liberal values, their machlok l'shem shemayim, their arguments for the sake of heaven, and this ideology, which does not want to allow for discussion and debate. And once we do that, and once they see for themselves that this ideology contradicts who they are as Jews, I think we can start to turn the tide. Well, I want to thank you again on behalf of the Zionist Organization of America. I just want to say to everyone in the audience, if you're not already involved with ZOA, please go to our website, uh, zoa.org. And uh, we don't ever want to make everything into a fundraiser, but we do uh, raise money. We're a nonprofit and we do rely on people to make contributions. And if you're moved by what we're doing and we're, we want to be strong allies of David's movement, even though we disagree with him on, on probably many things that we haven't gone into today, we really appreciate his, his point of view. Thanks very and much. I want to thank you again, David, and apologize to the, the people who had great questions that I didn't get a chance to ask. For everyone else, thank you very much for attending. And this concludes the program.